this isn't going to be like the usual mini air crash investigation video. I started researching one of these stories, and then I realized that something has been happening in the skies and runways of America. We've seen near miss after near miss, and I feel that without structural changes, we might see more and more collisions in the US. The first incident that we're going to look at is the story of JetBlue Flight 206. On the 27th of December 2023, an E-190 was about to land at Boston Logan International Airport. Now if you've watched my channel or if you've flown through Boston, you'll know that Boston is a maze of runways and taxiways. With that being said, technology has made Boston much safer. But tonight, that technology would be put to the test. The E-190 was cleared to land on runway 04 right, and as the E-190 streaked towards the runway, a Learjet was given permission to line up and wait on runway 09. As you can see here, both the runways intersect right here. The plan was to let the E-190 land and then let the Learjet take off. Easy peasy. As the E-190 was seconds away from touching down, the Mode X radar alerted the controller to a potential conflict. As the E-190 was flaring for touchdown, that is seconds away from touching down, they spotted some light headed towards them. They knew that they only had moments to act and they firewalled the throttles. The engines kicked right in and pushed the planes away. The two planes passed right on top of each other with just 30 feet separating them. To put that into context, that's a little bit more than four Shaquille O'Neal's separating two passenger jets. That should never be the case. The really interesting thing is that the pilot in the jump seat of the E-190 was recording this landing from the cockpit, and we have a still image showing how close the two planes really were. I'll put that picture up on screen right now, and if that doesn't give you a chill, I don't know what will. The pilots, without a beat, calmly went around and asked the controller for new vectors. The plane then landed safely, and the pilots were probably a little bit shaken, but grateful to be alive. So, how did these two jets come mere seconds from disaster? The investigators looked at the clearance that the Learjet had gotten. He was to cross runway 4 left onto taxiway Echo, and then take taxiway Mike to runway 9. He was then told to line up and wait, and then, for some inexplicable reason, instead of lining up and waiting, the pilot took off. When asked about this, the pilot of the Learjet responded that he thought he responded to the lineup and wait clearance, but in his head, he thought that he was already cleared for takeoff, and so he took off. If you're wondering, he eventually got a number to call when he was in his cruise. So this is the incident that I started researching, and that sent me down this near-miss rabbit hole, and boy, does it keep going. It was the 4th of February 2023, and a FedEx 767 was cleared to land at Austin's Bergstrom International Airport. The day was a foggy one, with the lights on the ground being turned up to their highest intensity setting. But even with the heavy fog over the airport, flights were landing and taking off. The show must go on, after all. Runway 18 left and 18 right were being used for departures. As all of this was happening, a FedEx 767 was established on the ILS for runway 16 left. The visibility was still bad, with them only having about 1400 feet of visibility at the touchdown point. A 737 at this time was getting ready to take off. The first officer let the controller know that they were ready to go, and he said, We're short of 18 left and we're ready. End quote. Well, they were almost ready. They were still 500 feet from the whole short point for runway 18 left, but since it was so foggy, the controller could not see any of this. The controller gave the southwest crew an all clear to take off from runway 18 left and let the pilots of the southwest plane know that there was a FedEx 767 on a three mile final. The pilots acknowledged and the 737 got on runway 18 left. In the cockpit of the 767, they were beginning to get a bit concerned. They knew that they were going to be cutting it close with the 737, and so they asked the controller if they were indeed cleared to land on the runway. The controller assured the FedEx crew that the 737 would be departing before they got there. The two planes were two miles apart at this time. The distance between them shortened to 1.5 miles, and the Southwest 737 was now on the runway, stopped because of the fog. The pilots of the 737 decided to do a static engine run-up because of the freezing fog conditions that the plane found itself in, and then they started their takeoff roll. The captain of the 767 heard the captain of the 737 say, roll in now, and with the 767 at just 300 feet, they needed to do something fast. The pilots of the 767 couldn't see anything out in front. The visibility was zero. 
So if the 767 did decide to land, then they would be landing blind on a runway that probably had another plane on it. As they cut through the fog, the first officer of the 767 had had enough and he called for a go around. The engines of the 767 spooled up. The first officer transmitted, Southwest aboard FedEx is on the go. The problem is that the abort call from the 767 came right as the Southwest 737 hit its V1 speed or decision speed. Now the 737 was fully committed to this takeoff. Right after the 737 lifted off, the 767 crossed the threshold of runway 18. They were both airborne over the same runway. The chances of a collision were high. Both pilots had the other on their TCAS displays. The Southwest captain shallowed out his climb to give the 767 as wide a berth as possible if the 767 were to fly overhead. But eventually both planes passed over the other safely and the 767 was able to land on their second attempt. So what happened here? In this case, the focus fell on the controller that was handling both the planes. Based on his phone activity and his speech patterns from earlier on in the day, it seemed like he was well rested and sharp. The misunderstanding started when the 737 crew said that they were holding short of runway 18 left. Remember, they said that they were holding short when they were actually 550 feet away. Thinking that they were at the whole short line, the controller was like, sure, go ahead, we have enough separation. The thing is, other planes use similar phraseology. We'll be right at 18 left or ready for takeoff 18 left are phrases that other planes used when they were getting close to the whole short line. So the controller was not unfounded in assuming that the jet was actually at the whole short line. In addition to this, Southwest had a stellar reputation at Austin with the controllers. The controllers expected that when a Southwest pilot said that they were ready to go, they were ready to go. Therefore, when the controller cleared the 737 for a takeoff, he expected the jet to be off the ground very quickly. But the thing is, as per paragraph 317 of the FAA Order 7110-65 Zulu, the controller must verify where a plane is before clearing the plane for takeoff. In this case, he did not, falling victim to what is known as expectation bias. He should have asked the pilots where they were in the airport before issuing that takeoff clearance. In this case, being able to track ground movements would have averted this from happening, and it would have been possible for the controller to know exactly where the 737 was without having to have a mental model of where all the planes were. But to be fair to the controller, if the plane had not stopped up for an engine run-up, they probably would have been able to take off with no issues with plenty of separation. So that's our second near-miss story. But dear viewer, this keeps going on and on. We have one more tale of near-miss in America. On the 13th of January 2023 at JFK International, American Airlines Flight 106 was getting ready to take off from JFK, bound for London Heathrow. Based on the ATA's information, they were expecting a takeoff from runway 31 left, and they were prepping for that mentally. But that quickly changed. They were now departing from runway 4 left, and so the captain reprogrammed the FMS and then briefed the crew about their new departure. The crew eventually got their taxi clearance and they were asked to taxi to runway 4 left via a left turn onto taxiway Bravo and to hold short of taxiway Kilo. The first officer responded with, Bravo short of Kilo, American 16. But as the American Airlines jet was being pushed back, the captain had something else on his mind. The jet was being pushed back and he was supposed to be getting an ACARS loadout message pertaining to all the cargo on the jet. But as the jet had some lithium ion batteries, which are classified as hazardous cargo materials, the loadout closes message was taking longer than usual. He taxied the plane slower than normal to allow for more time for the closeout message to arrive. As they taxied, the captain now asked the relief first officer to call a company operations agent via a radio to receive the loadout closeout. Then, at 8.43 and 46 seconds, the load closeout was received and they inputted this data into the flight management system. This usually would be performed on the ramp, but as they had a third crew member on board today, the captain thought that it would be okay to carry this out while they taxied. As they did this, the first officer navigated away from the airport diagram on her tablet to do the cross-check of the weight and closeout information. The captain and the first officer also talked about performance values at this time. Now, the American Airlines plane was getting close to the runway, and the controller asked them to cross runway 31 left at taxiway Kilo. The first officer responded, cross 31 left at Kilo for American 16 heavy. 
As all of this was happening, a Delta Airlines 737 to Santo Domingo was lining up and waiting on runway 4 left. The controller cleared the 737 to take off and he noted that the American Airlines 777 was near the taxiway kilo and instead of turning right, they started to do a turn left. The controller was not too concerned by this because he thought that they were taking a quick dash to the left to make this wide right turn easier for them. Besides, they had read back the taxi clearance perfectly, so the pilots of the 777 knew exactly what to do. The controller then got a call from another plane, American Airlines 107, about taxiing to the ramp, and he gave them their taxi clearance. Right after that, he was communicating with some airport vehicles about doing a runway sweep before they made a configuration change. Then the controller had a task to attend to. So after American Airlines 106 made their left turn, the controller was quite busy. In the cockpit, the first officer had her head down looking at performance data when she heard the captain say, cleared to cross. Then she looked at the runway and saw that there were no other planes and then went clear right. So the captain activated the runway lights and then took the plane onto the runway. Right then, Delta Airlines 1943 started its takeoff roll. As the nose wheel of the 777 entered runway 4 left, the 737 was pushing up against 100 knots. Right as the 777 entered the runway, the lights around the runway went bright red. The captain of the 777 did not know why that had happened, so he added power to cross the runway faster. The relief officer looked off to the right just to see the 737 starting to barrel down on them. But the first officer thinks that it's another plane taxiing on runway runway 4 left. The controller realized what was happening and immediately called out to the Delta 737 to reject their takeoff attempt in an attempt to get to them before they hit their V1 speed. The Delta crew braked hard and they were able to bring the jet to a stop 300 feet before the 777. When the 777 switched over to the tower frequency, the first thing that they heard was that there was a possible pilot deviation and to stand by for a number. In the case of American Airlines Flight 106, the pilots took a wrong turn. But it's not as simple as that. They were given the correct taxiway instructions and they read them back correctly, but they still went and crossed an active runway. This might be because they were still in the mental model where they were going to take off from runway 3 when left, as they initially thought, and had not readjusted to their near clearance of runway 4 left. The captain was so adept at this route that he could taxi the plane almost subconsciously. He had a mental model of how to get the plane to runway 4 left, but in this case that was wrong. A question that the investigators had was why the first officer and the relief first officer did not pick up on the mistakes that the captain was making. The first officer had her head down and was doing quite a bit of work as the plane was being taxied. The first officer knew that herself and the captain were quite familiar with JFK's layout, so the probability of them making a navigational mistake on the ground was so low. It is to be noted that when she made the clear left comment, she would have been able to see signage out the cockpit that would have told her that they were at the wrong runway, but she was more focused on making sure that the runway was clear. The relief first officer, on the other hand, was busy with things inside the cockpit, like handing out printouts and adjusting the radios. From his position in the cockpit, it would have been very hard for him to see what runway the plane was crossing. With that, Flight 106 crossed the wrong runway and right into the path of a 737. The thing is, with all of these near misses, we keep coming very close to an accident, and we got away by the skin of our teeth. Keep in mind, all of these three incidents happened in the span of just 45 days. Not even that long. Even after the collision in Washington, I don't think that there have been systemic changes made that are needed to avert near misses like this. At some point in the not too distant future, two planes are not going to get as lucky as the six planes of this video. What do you think? Has that much ado about nothing or is the US overdue for another collision? Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll talk to you guys next time. Stay safe.